I'm going to use this short video to explain the concept of the incidence of taxes and subsidies. It's quite a difficult one to start with, but once you get the hang of it, you'll be fine. What it means is looking at who subsidies or taxes affect. In the case of subsidies, we'll be looking at who gets the benefit from subsidies. In the case of taxes, we'll be looking at who pays the main cost. In both cases, the choices between consumers and producers. And as ever, it's down to relative elasticities of supply and demand. This is particularly important for us as we look at tackling market failure, because taxes and subsidies are some of the main instruments that we would use. And a government would always want to know who's going to pay the cost of a tax, consumer or producer, or who's going to get the benefit of a subsidy, consumer or producer. I'm going to start by showing you how to draw the diagram of the incidence of a subsidy. Once I've done it, I will talk you through how it works and how to make it easier for you and what it means. In this case, we've got demand and supply curves that are neither elastic nor inelastic. There's the initial demand curve, there's the initial supply curve. Where they intersect at A, we have our initial equilibrium. But when we introduce a subsidy, we actually shift the supply curve out to the right. And the vertical distance here, CB or EP2, is the per unit subsidy. Now, you'll, what you'll notice here is that the price for P1 minus P2 is actually smaller than the amount of the subsidy. So who gets the rest of the subsidy? Well, it's kept by the firm, E to P1. So how can we calculate the amount of the subsidy that goes to the consumer and the total amount that goes to the producer? Well, as I've written here, what we do is we take the price for, we multiply it by the new quantity, OQ2, not the old quantity, the new one. And as we draw that together, we get this rectangle, P1, P2, B, F. Colour that in, in these cases. And that gives us the incidence of the subsidy on the consumer. The incidence of the subsidy on the producer is calculated in a similar way. We take the amount that the firm keeps, EP1, and we multiply it by the new quantity, OQ2, turn that into a rectangle, EP1FC, and that gives us the incidence of the subsidy on the producer. What does this mean? Well, this green rectangle here on the top in this case for the producer shows us how much of the subsidy the producer keeps in total, 
And this rectangle here shows us how much of the subsidy the consumer keeps. In this case, it's broadly equal because of the elasticities I've given them. But there are lots of circumstances in which the incidence will not be the same and governments will need to bear this in mind when they set taxes and subsidies. So I'm going to change one of the elasticities here and see what happens. Once again, the diagram will draw itself first and then I'll explain it. In this case, the incidence of the subsidy falls almost entirely on the consumer because the price fall is so much larger as a proportion of the subsidy than the amount kept by the firm. So that's the incidence that goes to the consumer and that small amount is the incidence on the producer. It's about two thirds, one third. And the reason for that is the relative inelasticity of the demand curve. And this gives us our first rule. When demand is inelastic or when supply is elastic or both, the incidence falls mainly on the consumer. DIN sell. Demand inelastic, supply elastic. Think of the big DIN of selling in a big supermarket. It's the same rule for tax, but in that case it's extremely unwelcome. In this case, the consumer wants the incidence to fall on them because they get a lot of subsidy. No consumer would want a lot of tax. So what about for a tax? Is that any different? Well, in many ways it's a similar picture, although the supply curve moves inwards, and we'll also see that the rectangle of the incidence on the consumer is the other way round. The incidence of the tax on the consumer is now on the top rather than on the bottom. The other big error it's easy to fall into is to use the wrong quantities. To calculate the rectangles, we always use the new quantity, which in this case is smaller than the old quantity.
So with tax, let's explain how this works. Well, it's very similar to before because the supply curve moves, but it moves in the opposite direction. Once again, I've got a demand curve and a supply curve that are neither elastic nor inelastic. But the tax moves the supply curve up from S1 to S2 and the vertical distance between them, BC or P2E, is the per unit tax. How do we calculate the incidence of the tax on the consumer? Well, it's the same as before, really. We take the price rise due to the tax and we multiply it by the new quantity, which is actually lower because of the tax. But the price rise is not the whole amount of the tax. There's also the cost rise borne by the supplier. So we calculate the total incidence on the producer by multiplying this cost rise, P1 minus E, times the new quantity, OQ2. In this case, the incidence is broadly the same on both of them because their elasticities of the two curves are roughly the same. But what about if we change the elasticities again, as we did for subsidies? Actually, the rule is exactly the same here, but we'll demonstrate this by changing the elasticity of a different curve. Once again, I'm going to draw the diagram first and then comment on it afterwards. This is much the same as before, but with a crucial difference. Supply is much more inelastic here than it was before. It still shifts up to the left when the tax is added and the vertical distance between the lines between the supply curves is the per unit tax. But what that means is that the price rise is a much smaller proportion of the tax than the cost rise borne by firms. So when we come to calculate the incidence of the tax on the consumer, we multiply the price rise by this new quantity, which of course is smaller than the old quantity, and that rectangle is much smaller than the incidence of the tax on the producer. Let's have a look at why. It's when the demand curve is elastic, or the supply curve is inelastic, which is what I've shown here, then the burden of tax falls on the producer. So opposite to what we had before, supply inelastic, demand elastic, sin del, the incidence is on the producer. That means that the producer pays most of the tax in this case. But if it had been the other way round, inelastic demand or elastic supply, then the consumer would have paid most of the tax. So let's use this final slide to revise what we've learned about the incidence of taxes and subsidies. First, what is the incidence of a tax or subsidy? Well, the incidence means who it primarily falls upon, who it primarily affects. And policymakers will want to know this when they're trying to design the tax or subsidy. Secondly, is the incidence good or bad for you? Well, it depends on whether it's a tax or subsidy. If the incidence is of a tax and it mainly falls on you, that is a bad thing. If the incidence of a subsidy mainly falls on you, that's a good thing. You get to keep most of the government's money that's given through subsidy. So what are the rules to determine 
who the incidence falls upon. Well, they're actually the same whether it's a tax or subsidy. If demand is inelastic or supply is elastic, the incidence falls mainly on the consumer. And my little acronym there is DIN SELL. Think of a big selling DIN. The consumer buying a lot at a supermarket in a big DIN. If, however, the demand is elastic or the supply is inelastic or both, it the incidence falls mainly on the producer, sin del. But you've got to remember here that the incidence is an undesirable thing for tax and a desirable thing for a subsidy. Finally, a few tips for when you're drawing the diagrams. Remember that if you're drawing a tax, the rectangle of consumer tax is above producer tax. If you're drawing a subsidy, Remember that the rectangle of consumer subsidy is below the producer subsidy. In both cases, you draw the rectangles from the origin to Q2. But for the tax, Q2 is to the left of Q1. For the subsidy, Q2 is to the right of Q1. I deliberately haven't drawn here all the possible permutations of elasticity of demand and supply. That's something that you can work through on your own. But I've given you the rules and I've given you some examples to show how you would do this.